Imagine losing a parent at just two years old, facing a nigh, like face, facing a near fatal accident in your twenties, and realizing life's path needed a drastic change. Today's guest turned those painful experiences into a powerful drive for self improvement, crafting a mission to inspire millions worldwide. Now leading a team of 21, hosting a globally ranked podcast with over a million listens and transforming lives across 170 countries. He has redefined success and fulfillment on his own terms. So join us as we dive into the incredible journey of Ellen Larosa. Ellen, welcome to the show. What's happening? Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, I always want to start and end with gratitude because this at one point was a dream come true and I don't take it lightly to be able to speak into people's lives. I think it's a really big honor and I think it's a really important responsibility. Perfect. Perfect. Do you have a favorite quote, something that inspires or motivates you that you would like to share with our audience? The one that resonates most right now is, and I think it was Einstein, although apparently my girlfriend thinks that it was taken from, uh, Aristotle, but it's make things as simple as they can be, but not any simpler than they should be. Because as you and I talked offline, I'm a little overwhelmed in a good way. There's two things in business, right? There's not enough business or there's too much business. And I much prefer this one. So I'm grateful. Stay grateful when demand is high, but it doesn't change the fact that it's overwhelming. So I'm trying to simplify my systems and processes and business and team and my, my own life as well as much as possible. But life is complex, particularly in the 21st century. So you can't oversimplify either, right? So yeah. Indeed. Cool, cool. So tell us about Next Level University. What does this service do? Who is it for? And what's the main problem you're helping to solve? So the tagline is sort of Next Level U. Next Level University, uh, Next Level U is pun intended. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be 36 in November. So this is Alan version 3.6. You told me you had a lot of engineers that listen. So you are my people. I'm a computer engineer. Mm -hmm. And I think in numbers and formulas and systems and structures and statistics and uh, yeah. non engineers uh, don't honestly, they don't they don't. So there's other th modalities of thinking that they d they have. Uh, but yeah, so uh, to answer your question, is next level you pun intended. I'm Alan version 3.6 right now. No matter how hard your past has been, no matter where you find yourself today, there's a bigger, brighter, better future on the other side of you taking personal responsibility and improving yourself. So the tagline is level up yourself, level up your podcast, level up your business. We've got three podcasts. We've got a podcast production company. We work with 61 podcasters. I work with 26 clients in helping them with their business. Kevin, you said my business partner you had on the show, and he works with podcasters that want to start a business. I work with business owners that want to start a podcast, and we both do both. It's actually been really cool because we both have several clients that we both coach. Uh, and so it's really nice. And and uh, as you mentioned, we actually have an 18-person team now. We had to let a few people go, unfortunately. Uh, but ultimately, 18-person team, we work with like 115 or so podcasters slash business owners between all our different modalities. But next level you is level up yourself, level up your podcast, level up your business. We call them listeners, longers, and business owners. So listeners want to learn from us and improve themselves. Longers want to build their own podcasts and their own communities. And business owners have skin in the game and they really need to generate revenue to survive. Um, and so he's the podcast guy, I'm the business guy, and we both focus on self-improvement as much as humanly possible. Awesome. Awesome. Great. So, so Alan, most of our listeners are people who have either got some kind of um, a seed funding from accelerator programs uh, based in either London, uh, Paris, or, you know, major cities in Europe, um, or people who are, um, have saved some money from their nine to five jobs and then trying to get into, you know, the entrepreneur space. Um, one of the, one of the majority, uh, or, or I must say that most of the founders in their early journey they struggle with uh, one thing and that pops up all the time on my linkedin posts and and these interviews this this is about getting more attention to their business their product their idea their service right being into business generating uh, millions of uh, you know uh, sorry growing coaching 
hundreds of people and generating millions of uh, dollars for your different businesses. Uh, could you take us through your journey first to understand, uh, to make our listeners understand about what kind of struggles you had in the past and where you have reached through navigating through these struggles and challenges and, and, and taking the right direction. And then we will jump on the second part of getting the tractions on their products and services. How does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to try to condense 35 years into five minutes. So that's going to be mm -hmm. very challenging. So I'm going to go quick with it. But ultimately, uh, it started off tough. Uh, didn't know it at the time because I didn't know any different. And the other thing to understand before I start this story of my story is I started doing therapy in my 30s and I started to really understand this by rewatching the movie of my own life. And I've every year I kind of rewatch the movie of my own life. I go back to old photos and I have a really good memory. So I sort of, it's like when you watch a movie as a kid and then you watch it again as an adult and you go, oh, got it. That was that's, because of that. Yeah. yeah. So that's what's happened. So I didn't know any of this at the time. It's it's only in hindsight that it's very clear or much more clear, I should say. Okay, so two years old, you mentioned uh, I lost my father. He was 28. I had a mom who was 31, stay-at-home mom, and my sister was six. So my real last name is actually McCorkle. So my dad was John McCorkle, and he had a big Irish Catholic family. So it was Jim, Joe, John, Jean, Joan, Jeanette. So six kids, all... J. And so my real last name is McCorkle. My stepfather, his name is Steve Lazarus. He came into my life around age three, three and a half. And he was around until age 14. So I playfully refer to this part of my life as boats and BS. My mom and stepdad loved to have fun. They had what I refer to as a pleasure centered paradigm, which is a deep belief that life is about having as much fun as possible. And they loved to party. So they surrounded themselves with those kinds of people and boats and ski trips. So this was dot com bubble mid 1990s to early 2000s type of thing. So, you know, the US economy was booming and they did very well. My stepdad worked for a company called AGFA, AGFA. They did hospital computers. So it was wild times. I mean, we had snowmobiles and, you know, motorcycle. My mom drove a BMW. We lived on a, a big pond, small lake. We had a yacht. We had boats and. It was, it was uh, economic boom times, and it seemed like everyone had money back then in hindsight, by the way. The dot-com bubble was wild. But anyways, so uh, he left my family at 14, and he took his entire extended family with him. He also took 90% of the income with him, so I went from boats and ski trips and Xbox and Dreamcast and Christmas presents and that kind of thing. And my mom and stepdad did not get along, by the way. So as as fun and, and the adventure part was awesome about my early childhood, uh, there was alcohol. It wasn't wasn't great. It wasn't great. And my mom and stepdad did not get along. And that's a polite way to put it on a public medium. Okay, so he leaves, takes his entire extended family with him, takes 90% of the income with him. He gets the yacht and the apartment building. We get the house and the dog. And uh, I go from boats and ski trips to... I get free lunch at school now because our income is so low. I don't know how I'm going to go to college. My dream was to go to Worcester Polytechnic Institute. It was a mini MIT in Massachusetts, one of the best engineering schools in the world, actually. It was $50,000 a year back then, and that was wow. way... Yeah, and so I didn't know how... So I went from I hope I get in to even if I do get in, how am I going to go? I'm 14. And my that same year, my sister moves out with her older boyfriend. That same year, my mom actually gets in a fight with my aunt Sandy, and my aunt Sandy sort of ostracizes us from that side of the family. So I kind of lose three families by the time I'm 14 because we don't really associate much with the McCorkles when we were trying to be the Lazaruses. I've since reconnected with them, but I've only since seen two people from my mom's side uh, that have come back into my life since then, and that was 14 years old, and I'm 36 now, so that's 22 years ago. And my stepfather and his family, I haven't seen a single one of them since. So the abandonment challenges that came with that, there's fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. And I didn't know what fawn was. Fawn means you become sort of a social coward. I think goodwill hunting is kind of a good metaphor for that. You basically dim your light and, and pretend to be whatever people need. You chameleon yourself to be just to not be abandoned. And uh, so I became sort of a social coward a little bit. I definitely hid my engineering part. <laughs> 
Uh, because when you're in high school and a girl says, Hey, do I look fat in this? And you say, yes, at level six out of 10, that doesn't go very well. Um, and for the engineers out there, you it's like, that's the way I think I'm not trying to be mean. I just, that I thought you wanted the answer. So you learn very quickly that engineers are not welcome. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but I was this weird sort of esoteric semi-genius kid who science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, finance, built my first computer at 12. And, and so I got straight A's through high school. So fawn was the trauma response, but fight was behind the scenes. So I became socially, it was fawn, but fight behind the scenes, aim higher, work harder, get smarter, aim higher, work mm -hmm. harder, get smarter. I mean, just super esoteric achiever straight A's through all of high school. I got the president's award. It's behind me signed by George W. Bush. And it means you get straight A's 16 report cards straight all through all four years of high school. I graduate eight, eighth in my class. Uh, I get into WPI, I get tons of financial aid and scholarships and awards, and a lot of them are actually behind me. Uh, and I was able to go, I get my computer engineering degree. That was brutal, but it was kind of awesome. I graduate with high distinction. I get my master's in business and then I'm off to the races. So now this is post 2008. So it's like 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, though that four year stretch, I just crushed it. And I'm, I was a broke high school and college student. So I, my rent was 500 bucks with my girlfriend, Courtney at the time. Uh, I drove a 2004 Volkswagen Passat, which ended up saving my life. I'm going to get to that, but I didn't need much because I learned to go without for so long with my stepdad leaving. So I just made tons of money. I went from 65 to 85, 85 to 105, 105 to 125, 125 to peaking at 180. And I'm in my early twenties and I'm running. I remember when I was a global product manager at a company called Sensata Technologies, my portfolio was $60 million and I'm in my early 20s. So um, not my per personal money, but I was managing that product line. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of responsibility very, very young. I was around a lot of really smart people very, very young. And I basically didn't need very much, so I just banked all my money. So I paid off 84 grand worth of debt in a single year, college debt, gone. I just wanted to get out of debt put all the rest of my income into a Vanguard account with all different tech companies that I had a high probability of statistical success. Mm -hmm. I love that your in listeners are engineers because I can talk like this. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyways, Definitely. so because when you say like, well, I knew they'd win, it's well, you don't really know, but they most likely will, right? These techs are probably going to work and these probably aren't, right? So, uh, but anyways, so I I've always been this sort of weird, future oriented, esoteric science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, finance kid who also was this social coward who kind of like brought his high school friends to college and his college friends to corporate. And I just kind of brought everyone with me sort of thing. Then I get in my car accident, Ooh. 26 years old. My mom's side, there's one cousin who came back. His name is Jeff. His son, Dan, my second cousin was in the car with me. We're supposed to, I was supposed to yield. It was a dark winter night back in 2015 up in New Hampshire. We're going to TGI Fridays, not drinking or partying or anything. We were playing Call of Duty, going to TGI Fridays, 2015. I'm supposed to yield. I don't. The yield sign was covered with snow banks. Really bad winter that year. I'm supposed to yield. I end up on the wrong side of the road, cross the double yellows, and I look up from the GPS and I see what I thought was a Mack truck in front of me, right in front of me. Two things saved my life. Number one, it wasn't a Mack truck, fortunately. Uh, it was a lift-kitted pickup truck. There's a lot of those in New Hampshire. And number two thing that saved my life is the Volkswagen Passat. Thank you, Volkswagen. I used to call this car the tank. The whole front end was completely smashed in. This was a head on collision, a serious accident. And the whole front end was completely smashed in, but the frame stayed, the airbags deployed and everyone was okay physically. But my dad died in a car when he was 28. So I'm 26 at the time. And this is the second chance my dad never got. And so I'm questioning everything at this point. This was my quarter life existential crisis. And that's when I went all in on entrepreneurship. That's when I started my own company. That's so in hindsight, it's very clear. I was externally successful in corporate, but internally unfulfilled, drinking too much and too often, surrounding myself with the wrong people. Then I flipped the script. I went all in on self-improvement, personal growth, personal development, and I became happy, healthy, productive, fitness model, fitness competitor, fitness coach, love my life, meaningful work super fulfilled internally, but externally I went broke, liquidated all my assets, 
went broke. 227 rule in business takes two years to go into debt, two years to climb out, seven years to be successful. <laughs> and then after that, you got to sustain that is awesome. it. And, yeah. And I, I remember when I first heard that rule, I was like, not me, baby. Nope. Yeah, it's exactly what happened. So <laughs> now Kevin and I, uh, again, 18 person team heard in 175 countries. We have 1900 episodes we're coming up on now, uh, business coaching, podcasting, all that stuff. And it's overwhelming and it's awesome, but now I can authentically say I'm both successful externally and internally fulfilled, which I think is where everyone wants to get. That's what I help my clients get to. And it's very hard to do because the meaningful work you want to do in the world is not always the work that the economy pays the most for. It's very mm -hmm. hard to find the epicenter between, you know, what you really are good at, what is meaningful to you and what the economy will pay for. It's very hard to find that epicenter. And that's really what I do now is I help people build businesses around that, that center point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I, I always discuss um, this Ikigai thing with everyone because it's so important, right? Because if you find out what you like to do and what you will get paid for and what was the other two, two things, I think three things, so what do you like to do? What you can get paid for and, um, what are you really good at is one of them. I think, yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I have my own three circles. So the first mm -hmm. one is what's meaningful work to you. And I underline the word work. Mm -hmm. The second one is what are you statistically great at? And it needs to be statistically oh. because it can't be your mom thinks you're great at it. Right. And then the third one is what will the economy actually pay you for? And not just now, but in the future. And that's the hard one because what the economy will pay you for is very different a lot of times than, than what's fulfilling. And so it's very hard to find that epicenter. Mm. Cool. And when you, when you reach to this place, um, is it like the first instance when you started uh, next level university, next level you, or is that name something else, or it was supposed to do something else. And then you pivoted to next level you. How did yeah. how did that work? Or or let me ask you this question in another way. Let's talk about where the story began. Where did the idea for Next Level University came from? Cool. So if I were to talk just the entrepreneurial part of that journey, uh, I started a company during my MBA called Campus Libre. It was a mm -hmm. campus specific Craigslist for textbooks, and we won. Uh, what was called the strange innovation award we won a business awards uh, we competed in we had a fairly successful profitable website pretty quickly actually uh, it started mm -hmm. out with textbooks and then we were going to go to more things because college students have to buy and sell things a lot right uh, and then the team and i the ceo and i i was the cmo he was the ceo and we got in a argument and we had diverging visions and that was a painful conversation. That was like four hours, lots of tears flew because I pour, I pour my heart and my soul into everything I do. I'm, I'm, I'm a try hard. That's going to be very clear to everybody. I'm, I'm a try hard. I don't, I don't dabble in anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that's an excessive part of my nature. However, uh, they went out of business as I figured they would. And, uh, but that was a sad day for me. So I'm a, I'm a massive failure in many regards in terms of like the amount of businesses that have failed. So let me explain. So Campus Libre went, that was back in 2012. Uh, then I started my own company called Alan Lazarus LLC after my car accident. This is in 2015. Mm -hmm. Alan Lazarus LLC, the slogan was what you'll never learn in school, but desperately need to know. And it desperately is in all caps. Mm. And my goal was to speak at high schools and colleges and middle schools and bring personal development to the school system. And that, uh, it worked a little bit, but it was a you know terrible slogan for trying to get into schools and then eventually i was like you know what i'm going to start a podcast called conversations change lives because i at this point i'm looking at my past and i'm looking at the people i grew up with and i'm seeing a massive delta between where i'm going and where they're going and i'm trying to figure out what made the difference like why did i have so much success and most of my friends from home are still struggling paycheck to paycheck or working minimum wage jobs or whatever. And the truth is computer engineering, like that's really what it is. If you go to one of the best technology colleges in the world and you're a computer engineer in the 21st century, you're just very sought after because there's not enough computer engineers and every company needs more engineers. So I kind of yeah. understand now why that happened. 
like I had an interview at SpaceX way back and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that said, I also thought, at least back then, that the difference was I had great mentors and coaches. Of course, I didn't give myself the credit. So I thought it was because I had access to people at iRobot and different companies that I'd worked for. And so I created a podcast called Conversations Change Lives. And, and the idea was I want to interview people about behind the curtain of what it's really like to be in the profession. Because when you're young, you pick a career based on zero data. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, engineers make a lot of money. Engineers are good at math. Alan, you should be an engineer. Okay, cool. Now, fortunately, I'm very engineering oriented and thinking, so that worked out really well for me. But that was not enough to go on. You don't pick your career based on that little amount of information. So why not interview an engineer and ask them about what it's actually like? And so that was the podcast. And so uh, Kevin was my first guest on Conversations Change Lives podcast. Mm -hmm. I was his first guest on the Hyperconscious podcast, Change the Way You Think, Change the Way You Act, Change the Way You Live. It was a couple sort of bodybuilding bros who both think differently and who are kind of uh, both lost their father. So, so I lost my father when I was two in a car accident. He didn't meet his father until he was 27, so his father wasn't around. And so in hindsight, it's very clear that we were two peas in a pod in many regards. But ultimately, I was his first guest. He was my first guest. We teamed up. We had the worst named podcast in history, which was the Conversations Change Lives Meets Hyperconscious podcast. And then we had to go all in on Hyperconscious, which is change the way you think, change the way you act, change the way you live, which is the opposite of living unintentionally. It's it's living consciously, living hyperconsciously. Mm -hmm. And if you look up hyperconscious in the dictionary, it means acutely aware. And then four years later or so, we rebranded to Next Level University, which is level up your life, love, health, and wealth. And it's a podcast where you become the best version of yourself, essentially, and you reach your potential. And I think that the world desperately needs more people who are trying to reach their potential. If I, if I had one thing that frustrates me the most, it's when I see people squandering their potential. And by the way, it frustrates me when I do it too. So that's kind of the story. Got it. And this is very inspiring because, you know, Coming from background where you had, a, a, you know, a tragedy in your life early in the age, then you got somebody to take care of you who took you to a level where you experienced things which not generally normal people could do. And then suddenly it has taken away from you instantly. And then you have lost into the world and then you, you lost all the assets you had and then you had to rebuild everything from scratch right this is like it, it's a very bumpy ride in my <laughs> eyes um and and coping up with that building your life and living your life on your term these are very specific and very bold decisions one can make especially with mm -hmm. such a young age if you know what i mean mm -hmm. living on your own terms is not easy in today's world the moment you get sucked up with this nine to five race the moment you get comfortable in that space where you have a mortgage a car insurance a car loan uh, uh, a debt for your education you don't want to get out of it because it's so comfortable right it, mm -hmm. it's not easy but you did that. Obviously, you had a couple of triggers in your life, but everyone, one of us has this. So I think what I would like to learn from you, conscious of time, that after you got off, out of it, I'm sure when you restarted your life, what were the challenges you were facing in order to build your business? And how did you overcome these challenges? Well, the first thing to understand about my story in general, and I think it's really important to kind of provide this context. I used to be too much of a coward to share this. Uh, I had three advantages, really four. I had four advantages. And honestly, I've reassessed upside down and sideways my entire existence and uh, only four, it turns out. Pretty much everything else statistically went kind of horribly wrong. Uh, there's something called an ACE score adverse childhood experiences and people with high ACE scores like me tend to face early mortality. So my car accident, had that been an early mortality, that actually wouldn't have been uncommon, statistically speaking. Uh, that said, the four advantages that I used to be too much of a coward to share, I need to, and then I'll get into the business stuff. Uh, because ultimately, I actually used to think everyone should be an entrepreneur and I was really ignorant. I was ignorant about what made me different. I don't think that at all anymore. 
I actually think a, a comforting life that is maybe a nine to five or whatever you want to call it is actually the, the, the right path for most people. Because I'm realizing as I get older and older and older and I mature that most of what I've done through these adversities actually isn't doable for everybody. And I, and I say that not trying to be pretentious or preachy. I, I, I say that out of actual awareness because now I've coached hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the world, 26 individuals right now that I'm coaching. And I, I used to coach people not knowing how different I was. Like I haven't taken a single day off in 10 years. Since that car accident, I've worked every day. Now, that doesn't mean I work 14 hour days every day, but I need to be very clear about this. Like, I don't wake up in the morning and wonder what to do. I'm an engineer, I'm an esoteric weirdo. I, I have a lot of grit from a terrible childhood. To me, it's, it's all day, every day, and, and it never shuts off. And it never has shut off. The only way I could shut this brain off is with alcohol. Mm. Um, and I quit drinking and now it's on fire all the time. So I need to be very clear that there is a nature and nurture aspect to this that if you don't have it, it's okay. All right. So that said, and then I'll, on top of that too, I'll, I'll give you the four advantages and I'll just get off my soapbox. Okay. Number one, I was born in the U S by far the largest economy. You can look this up. It's not close. Okay. The next mm. closest is China. And even that it's not close. So, um, that's a big deal that changes everything, right? Massachusetts per capita is one of the most educated places on planet earth. And that's where I grew up. Okay. It's basically a giant state of colleges. <laughs> I'm being playful, but it's it mm -hmm. matters, right? It matters. Num number two, the U.S. Uh, had financial aid for me that allowed me to go to one of the best engineering schools in the world uh, that I wouldn't have been able to go to without that assistance. And I could tear up talking about it because I know there's other people that uh, don't get that opportunity. And that's one of the reasons why I do Next Level University is because if you have a sincere desire to improve your life, there is a free resource for you mm. um, that's going to tell you the truth, right? Not, not you know, make it seem easier than it is to, for status or whatever. Uh, okay, so, so there's th the to those two advantages. And then the third advantage, and, and this is the one I was way too cowardly to share in the past, but it's probably pretty clear to anyone who's listening and and... Uh, is, is some of us are actually gifted. Some of us are extremely gifted. And for me, when I was a kid, I didn't understand why I was good at everything. I was better than all my friends at most stuff. And I didn't understand why. And so I, I used to think that a lot of people were very unintelligent. And I didn't understand why I thought that. And then Kev said, why do they have to be unintelligent? Why aren't you just very intelligent? And I remember thinking to myself, I don't walk around thinking I'm intelligent all the time because to me, I'm still an idiot. Like compared to what there is to know, I know nothing. And that's the frame I'm thinking from. But then I would look at these other people and I would look at their irrational decision-making and I would be like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? So my therapist, Carol, she said this, she said, your genius saved you because statistically speaking, that life that I described, and I'm only giving you at the tip of the iceberg of my adversity, most people would never have made it out of that. And the truth is most people I grew up with didn't. And mm. so, uh, at the end of the day, th the last piece, the fourth advantage is self-belief. Now here's the question. A lot of people don't believe in themselves. So when adversity strikes, the escape is the way. So when life hits you and it knock and it, you, you know, the Steve jobs, you get hit in the head with a brick do you retreat or does it drive you see for me it drives me kevin my business partner it shuts him down adversity shuts him down for me it does not shut me down at all it freaking drives me in a way i couldn't possibly describe mm. now how what what happens when you combine biggest economy with uh the opportunity to get financial aid uh, with a social coward who was mistreated and his response to that was aim higher, work harder, get smarter, and who happens to have tons of self-belief and happens to be sort of gifted. Okay, there you go. Now, I don't want to take my accomplishments away from me. I'm very proud of them and I love achievement. It's one of my favorite things in the world. That's why I have the courage to have all these awards behind me. At the end of the day, I realize that my potential is so much higher than anything I've ever reached 
and I need to be clear about the advantages because the truth is most people wouldn't be where I am had they started where I started. And that's just the truth. Okay. And then the fifth one, I'll go quick with this, but like white Caucasian male in the U S like there are advantages to that as well. And, and there actually have been some disadvantages. It turns out. Cause I, I remember I didn't get an IBM job once because I was a white Caucasian male, which really bothered me a lot, honestly, but I realize why affirmative action. I, I get it. I get it. So with those out of the way, now I can talk to you about business and some of the principles that have helped me. But the truth of the matter is most people are not going to succeed. I have a lot of people uh, who I graduated college with who are very successful multimillionaires in corporate and they're going to continue being successful, but they're going to continue sort of doing the main regular thing. And uh, I actually don't think most of them should start businesses. And the reason why that is, is because the amount of, so business is about three main things from my understanding. The first one is systems and structures and metrics and finance and numbers. And that is the engineering part. And in the 21st century, more than ever, like if you don't understand that stuff, you're in so much trouble. And if you think linearly instead of exponentially, you're even worse off. Okay. So that's number one. Number two is products and services and innovation. You need to have a better product and service constantly, and you need to improve it constantly. And that's a constant struggle of, okay, how do we make this thing better every freaking day forever? And then how do we brand it, market it, sell it? Okay. The third one is about people and very few people are good at the first two and the third one. And that's why business partnerships are so important. And that's why Y Combinator and incubator program literally won't even take you on unless you have a business partner. Yeah. Kevin's good with people. I'm kind of good at people for an engineer. I'm really good at the first two. He's really good at the third one. And honestly, he sucks at the first two. I'm not trying to be mean. I love Kevin. He would say the same. He's awful at the first two. So you have artists and scientists. You have Wozniak and Steve Jobs. You have Bill Gates and Paul Allen. You have Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. You have, you have these business partnerships that, that have the whole equation when they're together, but apart, they would never be where they are, right? Oprah Winfrey is wonderful and I adore her in many regards. I respect her deeply, but trust me, there's an engineer in her corner helping her and no one knows about that person. And so if you are out there and I, I, I want to share this story very briefly. I had a client, his name's Udit. He, I went to college with him. He was in the same apartment building as me. Love Udit. Udit is starting a, he wants to, uh, help pharmaceutical companies. He, he doesn't like the clinical trial process about the way that pharmaceutical companies essentially have to spend tons and tons and tons of money to try to get these clinical trials done in order to get approval from the FDA. So he's trying to connect people with clinical trials in a, in a crowdsourced cheaper way. And he has a great app and he's an engineer and he's very smart and I loved coaching him. But I did have this moment while I was coaching him where I said, you're screwed. Why? English is not his first language. Whether we like it or not, English is the number one language on planet Earth in, in business. And the reason yep. why is the U.S. is the biggest economy. Okay, it is what it is. And and whether we like right, wrong, or indifferent, it's, it's, it is the truth. Okay, and the third piece of this is he's not a strong communicator. Steve Jobs was smart and good at storytelling and good at effective communication and good at branding, marketing, sales. He understood people. Now, sometimes he was an esoteric dickhead and I get it. Okay. I do. And I'm not saying he's a leader that I want to aspire to. What I will say, however, is that I've met a lot of engineers and you need someone who can communicate effectively. You need someone, especially in the 21st century, you have the company, you have the brand, you have the person, and then you have the product. Nike is the company. Nike is the brand. Michael Jordan is the person and Air Jordan is the product. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can do the same thing with Tesla. You know, Tesla's the company, Tesla's the brand, Elon's the person, the model Y is the product. The, the person matters more and more and more. And that's where personal branding comes in. And at the end of the day, if you don't have a person who has grit, work ethic, level 10 leadership, who it takes personal responsibility, who also happens to be gifted, you most likely will never create a billion dollar company. And these billionaires don't know that. They don't know that they're different because they've always been this way. And, and I coach enough people who aren't gifted to realize like you guys are setting yourselves up for failure because you're never going to be like that. 
And that's okay. It doesn't mean you can't create a $150,000 business that turns into a $500,000 business that turns into a million dollar business. But if you're trying to be like Steve Jobs or like Elon Musk or like Richard Branson, you are in serious trouble because these people are gifted beyond what they're aware of. And they're also out of their minds in many regards too. <laughs> true, true. No, I, I totally, totally resigned with that because, you know, it's hard to learn these lessons with experience. Nobody's going to tell you this. Yeah. If you go to your friends, if you go to your mentors, if you go to your um, investors, they will always try to motivate you. They're not going to criticize you on your face unless you do like very dumb things, right? Yeah. But then you, you learn these things with the experience and then the experience pushes you into the right direction. And I totally, totally agree with you that not everybody can become a founder. Yeah. And that's why we have jobs. That's why we have other things in the in the world. Not everybody so, should, right? Yeah, that's not everybody thing. should. Yeah. 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 Great stuff. Cool. Uh, conscious of time, um, Alan, before we go towards the end of our interview, where I have some quick fire, six quick fire questions, I wanted to um, ask you a couple of uh, questions very quickly. Number one. Being master of yourself, being self-conscious, and, and the word I have noted down, hyper-conscious. What is the advice you give to our listeners, especially the people who are in the, in the, in the startup space or their founders? Um, they always complain about they don't have time. Although, <laughs> theoretically, everyone has 24 hours in their life, right? <laughs> How do you keep? so calm and how do you manage your time every day so that you have maximum productivity maximum output and what is the advice you want to give to our listeners on that that spectrum the best lesson i ever learned was a deeper level of pareto so will wilfredo pareto was a scientist who most people have heard of it's the 80 20 rule but mm -hmm. uh, just the origin story i think helps it stick he had pea pods and pea plants and 20% of the pea plants produced 80% of the peas, essentially is what he found in his research. And a deeper level of Pareto is actually critical if you want to scale anything. So for example, I'm a business owner. Emilia and I, we, we run three businesses between the two of us. We have three pets, no children yet, uh, but we run a household and we work out, we've worked out, we've exercised every day, I'm very grateful to say, uh, for over two and a half years now. And it's 45 minutes a day, so it's nothing crazy, but it's been hard to manage with everything. Mm -hmm. So how do you, and that's why most of these business leaders are out of shape, by the way. It's, it's very hard to do everything well. And my point is, in this principle, is Pareto, a deeper level of Pareto. And for the engineers, you'll love this. For the non-engineers, bear with me. 20% of effort and time produces 80% of your results. Okay, awesome, Alan. Thank you so much. We get it. That's, that's regular. What you don't realize is that if you take 20% of 20%, you get 4%. If you take 20% of 4%, you get 0.8%. If you take 20% of 0.8%, you get 0.16%. And if you take 20% uh, of 0.16%, you get 0.04%. I call them my 0.04% essentials. Mm. So everyone, you can take your whole career and or company and reverse engineer the outcome you want 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. And... I realize that not everyone can do that, but you can find the 0.04% essentials that are necessary every single day, week, uh, month, quarter, year, decade in order to actually scale. And by the way, if you crunch the numbers, so 20% of time and effort producing 80% of results, that's a one to four ratio. Okay. If you do it again and you get the 20% of 20% for the 4%, it's one fourth times one fourth, which is one sixteenth. Mm. And if you go all the way to 0.04%, and you guys can all do the math on your own on this, what I've calculated is it comes to one input of time and effort actually gives you a 1024x return. Now, here's mm. the problem. People say, well, if you could go to Vegas and put a dollar in and get $1,024 back, how long would you play? That's the dumbest thing ever. Here's why. <laughs> because if I put a dollar in and then get punched in the face for three years, then I get the money. That's kind of what entrepreneurship is actually like. Okay. So the truth is, is I put a dollar in today and I don't see any return for a decade. 
because the thing that's the little leverage point that really freaking matters a lot in the future, urgent, important, significant, in the exponential growth of your company is actually the least shiny thing now. So for example, my 1024X leverage points, I can give you them, is podcasting, training, and coaching. Podcasting is one to scale, casting wide nets, finding the other esoteric weirdos like me. Training is one to several. We have a group coaching program. I do book club every single week of self-improvement books with self-improvement people. Uh, we have a monthly meetup every month, that kind of thing. And then coaching is one-on-one -on -one, and it's business coaching. So for me, those are my top three leverage points that I never miss. That's why I'm here right now. I can't be amazing at everything. I tried. I was a mm. snowboarder. I basketball. Bah, 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 bah. I drink and I party and barbecues. And bah. I I lost my mind and I lost myself. You can't be amazing at everything. However, you can be world class at a couple things. And if you pick the right things, that's meaningful work for you that you're statistically great at and only gonna get exponentially better at, and you it's what the world will pay you for. I use Taylor Swift for an example. Guitar, songwriting, and performing, and singing. If you take away those four things, she's immediately not Taylor Swift. Mm. It's gone. So if she ever failed at those four things, she wouldn't be who she is today. And that's the truth, right? And there's a lot of people who are good at singing. There's not a lot of people that are good at all four. All four, yeah. Right? And she has the right people around her, branding, marketing, sales, all that stuff. Um, that kind of thing. And she's also seems like a wonderful person, in my opinion. She seems like she has a great heart. Now, that's my point, though, is everyone out there needs to find their 0.04% essentials, and you need to stick to them every freaking day and never miss. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I have Monday through Saturday, I do front facing 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., although I wish it was 6. Uh, and I do po podcasting training and coaching, and that's the only things I allow on my calendar at this stage. I didn't, I couldn't start that way. At the beginning, you have to do everything, okay? Um, but that's why we're scaling and growing and so much demand is because I'm actually focused on small know, bit, yeah. those that small things. Perfect yeah. bit, yeah. yeah, great, got it, cool, perfect. Thank you so much. So, yeah, let's let's uh, go through. So I do this with all of my um, guests on the show go through what we have discussed and if we have missed something and then obviously you can you know tell us a little bit more about <laughs> nice uh, drawing man <laughs> this yeah, is awesome. sorry for the for the schedule yeah. because my drawing is not that great you know right. so basically what we have learned is even though you had setbacks in your life early stages or even later or currently there is always a trying to improve there is always place where you can ignore the bad habits and get into the good one and you know, grow, right? A couple Probably. of things, very important. Um, you need to figure out a place for you, which is according to your your own uh, coin term, which is in Japanese word is ikigai, but you say that what's, what's the meaningful work for you as an individual, as a person, right? That crossovers with statistically what you are good at, correct? And Top then- 5%. Yeah. Top five percent, and then what's the economy will pay for you, and then whatever is overlapping this particular, I guess, this purple space that is what you're looking for, right? Yeah, and that's the zero point zero four percent leverage point, and then you need to learn how to lead and build a team around it. Yeah, and that's why leadership yeah. is so important. It's Most so engineers important. are not strong leaders. Engineers are more needed in business than ever before in history but they tend not to be strong leaders. So if you can be an engineer and a strong leader and actually study leadership, you can really change the world, I think. Yeah, and that, that's what I wanted to talk in the next part, which is uh, you know three important bits which you have to be good if you want to become a successful founder, which is systems, product and services, and people. Yep. Right. yep. Cool. And we discussed the Pareto principle. Uh, anything else you think we should add into this? Uh, all I'll reiterate is if if there are any engineers out there, the people one is going to be the problem. <laughs> ah, got it. And got by it. the way, if you're not an engineer, it's the first two that's going to be the problem. You better get yourself mm -hmm. a, a, a awesome engineer in your corner. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Great. So that's perfect. So let's move on to our quick fire round. I've got six quick fire questions for you. Um, 
and you can answer them as quickly as possible. Are you ready? Ready. Let's rock and roll. Great. Cool. What's the top three strategies to plan your business, plan yourself, plan your individual day, to be honest, to be, to be fair, uh, for a founder in 2024? Break your day into thirds. The first third is for you. You have to build yourself first. The second third is for service. You have to do service in the world, profitable service, hopefully. And then the third is for fitness, food, and family. You got to take care of your body. You got to take care of your family, and you you got to um, feed your body as well. And I think intermittent fasting is the best productivity hack in the game. If you're eating several times a day, you'll get sluggish throughout the day. Whereas if you fast for 12 hours a day, you not only get some health benefits, but you you are so productive. Yeah. 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 I, I've, I've experienced it myself. So, you know, I can vouch for it. Great. What book would you recommend to our audience and why? Uh, all the Jim Collins books. If you want to be a founder and a business owner, the Jim Collins books are world class. I have them all over here. Mm -hmm. uh, great by choice, good, good to great, built to last. The flywheel concept is super powerful. And then uh, How the Mighty Fall. And then there's Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. Jim Collins has the best business books I've ever found, I think. Cool. What's one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful founder? Uh, unbelievable amounts of grit. Mm. How much can you come back from massive pain, suffering, and failure? I, I do not agree that big rewards can ever come from minimal effort. I think that you can only do that through status and perception. And I don't think that's ever fulfilling. So to me, I look for humility and grit and work ethic. Good. What's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Uh, habit tracking. Habit mm -hmm. tracking. I, I use Google Sheets. I have you know goals, reverse engineered metrics, habits, and skills, and then identity work. But the metrics and habits I track every single day with all my clients, including my entire team. Google Sheets is free and it's awesome. Cool. What's a new or a crazy business idea you would love to pursue if you had time? I want to still bring personal development to the education system. I I feel like I wish that I had learned some of these fundamental principles about mindset and and uh, empathy and courageous communication and vulnerability when I was younger. I really mm. wish that we could bring, um, you know, personal development, self-improvement and personal growth into schools. Cool. And last but not least, what's an interesting fun fact about you that most people don't know? Oh, I'm obsessed with film. I adore it. My girlfriend for our five year anniversary, we just got, she just got me a projector. I actually uh -huh. don't even know the name of this thing. It's awesome. It's the coolest thing ever. So I got a home theater now and uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I love food and film and I put those two together and there's nothing like a good inspiring film. Cool. Alan, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and packing the last years of building this business and some of the ups and downs along the way. People want to get in touch with you. They want to learn about Next Level University. What's the best way to do it? Thank you, Ash, for having me. That was a really cool drawing. I almost want you to send it to me so I have my own story in my head. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it for being here. I started with gratitude. I want to end with gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where you can find me, we have a website called nextleveluniverse.com. Everything's on there. We do monthly meetups. We have a free book club. We got a journal called the Dreamliner that helps you reverse engineer your dreams. We got a lot of stuff. Uh, you can also go to Next Level University. So it's our podcast. We have an episode every single day, 1% improvement in your pocket from anywhere on the planet, completely free. So if you want to improve yourself and improve your life, and reach your potential next level university you can google us we're on all the youtube and platforms and all that perfect alan thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your inspiring journey and the impactful work you're doing through next level university it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Forms Podcast. it has been an honor thank you thank you so much Thank you all for tuning into this episode of Founders Podcast. I hope you found our conversation with Alan insightful and inspiring. Go on to Next Level Universe and uh, you know connect with him if you want to get upgraded by yourself. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to our podcast and stay updated on our future interviews. Stay inspired, stay motivated, and keep building.